Well, once again, hello, everyone, and welcome to your Monday monthly webinar on OCD and substance use, where we focus on that topic. Of course, we will take questions in any and all areas, but since Stacy and I have a little pet thing that we do, which is we are the <laughs> OCD SUD special interest group leaders for the International OCD Foundation, we decided this would be fun once a month to uh, get on here and do this. And and uh, we got to start, you know, we got to do, we got to start uh, getting a couple of special guests lined up, Stacy. So we'll have to yes. work on that. So why don't we do that? Um, all right. We'll work, we'll work that in. Maybe we'll have a few friends come join us. As always, please feel free to list your, um, uh, Hmm. Oh, let me just see. Uh, yes, as as always, please list your questions. We would love to take them and uh, check them out. So, yeah, and I'll just put a plug in for the website as I always do. Yes, please. Um, uh, the ocdsud.com. Um, we have some resources up there on both OCD, SUD, some you know book recommendations that help people understand and you know address there's not a book that combines both but we try to give ocd information and sud information depending on which area you come from they help both professionals family members and people living with either or or both um, yeah. and some of them are based in exposure and some of them are based in act we really tried there's not a ton it's you know but we did get a good cross section there's some videos on there. Uh, Dr. McGrath is featured in several of them, along with previous trainings we've done at various IOCDF conferences. So go check it out. Share it with people who could benefit from the information. All right. Well, let's get in this and see what's going on. And uh, we'll make a few other announcements along the way. So. Mindful Mind says, harm OCD every day, starting from bad dreams to driving to me not paying attention at the store and pushing people with my cart. Uh, even if you didn't really push the cart, you can't do it anymore. I'm wondering what that means that you can't do it anymore, as in you can't do compulsions anymore for this. Uh, I would agree with you that that would be a great idea to accept that you can't do any more compulsions for this and that you're going to want to be able to be with whatever the intrusive thoughts and images and urges are. Now, um, I will, I will say this, uh, you know, just, just in, in a similar vein to that mindful mind, Stacy and I will commit to when we are together at the IOCDF conference to, to spending a lot of time thinking about how we could maim, kill, harm each other and and frankly why not everyone at the conference stacy why don't we just pledge that when we go to the conference and we're just going to put this out there now in case any authorities or anyone are listening stacy and i will be contemplating all sorts of ways to bring uh <laughs> destruction and and chaos. And destruction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes now we're going to think about it right and we're going to have images and urges about it in our heads and that's what we're going to do And we'll, we'll see if anything happens. So, so mindful mind. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how much of the thoughts that are in your head, the images, the urges that you're experiencing, are you seeing as a reflection of you as a person? Like, is there a, a moral scrupulous kind of experience here where, you know, good people wouldn't think these things, which of course is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a good person, and trust me, I have these thoughts all the time. You know, even though yeah. I don't pay attention to them anymore, the, the, that aspect of OCD does not have control over my life the way it once did. Those thoughts still pop into my head, you know, from time to time. And I'm just like, oh, hi, there it is again. Yep, thank you for your opinion. Yeah, and you want to maybe speak a little to that about your, your own lived experience with that yeah. and, and how um, much that so played a role. Mm -hmm. Harm OCD is part of, you know, the little dude in my head, as I refer to it. Um, Cause for me, I stole the technique out of a book I read years ago about naming your OCD. Um, I, I'm also a therapist. 
work with people, I have them name their anxiety. Uh, I've, patients of mine have found and I have found it takes it out of this big amorphous, oh my God, OCD, and turns it into this entity that, you know, I can tell to screw mm-hmm. off, um, which I find very beneficial because there are times where, you know, you, you have the thoughts. And when I was going through my own therapy, I did ERP, but also I could say, hey, what will do it in my head? I don't have time for you right now. I'm focused on something else. Shut up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found it beneficial. Some of the patients I work with find it beneficial. Some of the patients I work with think, you know, I'm a few French fries short of a Happy Meal too, but that's okay. Um, but when you have the thought, it can feel very overwhelming. I mean, I was convinced that I was going to hurt somebody and go to prison. And you get the sinking feeling along with the anxiety that you just are going to screw up your entire life. And I take public transportation because I'm also legally blind. So I would literally get off the bus. And at that time, I lived in Massachusetts. Getting off the bus in the winter, (laughs) it was 20 degrees outside. I'd be outside for, you know, 20, 30, 40 extra minutes waiting for another bus to get back on and try it again. Um, and you do all these things, sit on, sit on your hands, have, hold something in your hands, tie your hands up in, in your, like all these compulsive behaviors to make sure I didn't have the capacity to hurt somebody. Um, you know, I wouldn't invite people to go places because if I invited them, then they would get in a car accident and it would be my fault because I invited them. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, so it is overwhelming, but not once did it come true. Um, you know, and it, the thoughts are just thoughts. And the fact is I still have them from time to time, but now I'm more like, Oh yeah. Okay. There we go again. It yeah. doesn't have the power that it once had because of the ERP. And if I find yeah. anything has power, I will use ERP because every once in a while something comes up in life and it, it, it does, it, it is triggering. And so I go, okay, if that was too triggering, then I need to step back and do some ERP around this. And I find that very beneficial. So for years, I understand the feeling of being overwhelmed by the thoughts, but if you do engage in ERP or an act-based treatment protocol and work at it, it does take the power away. And I think a lot of times people want it to take the intrusive thoughts away and they do reduce, they do reduce. Mm -hmm. They're not as extreme as they once were, but the power of them is this big, this big, you know? Um, You know, what's amazing to me, because I've known you post-treatment. Yes. And the thought that you would care at all about asking me to go somewhere because I might get hurt, (laughs) it just... I chuckle inside because yeah, you would be okay. like, I don't give a shit. Yeah. If he gets hurt or not. yeah. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And yeah. you know, the, the, once you get to a certain point, you know, like you and I, we, I mean, we have a, a, a sar- sarcastic rapport that we have. Uh, built a lovely, uh, such a dear friendship that we yes. wish death upon each other constantly. Mm-hmm. Yes. Constantly. Absolutely. Yeah. And in mm-hmm. creative yeah. and different ways. Mm-hmm. But you get to that point where you can, because you, you understand that you, a thought is just a thought and OCD is what makes it seem real. And OCD is, is, is treatable. But how many of time okay. and effort? I mean, ERP is not easy. Don't get me wrong. It was probably the hardest thing I did, but it was also the most freeing thing I did. How many of your OCD intrusive thoughts and images and urges came true? Mm. That would be zero. I would think zero, maybe one, maybe because by chance, you know, there's, there's times something could happen, right? Like, yes. 
Well, and actually, I think I've said this on the on the webinar before. One time I was like completely freaked out about, you know, not passing a college exam yeah. and somebody got too close to me on the tee and I turned around and I pushed him a little bit. But, you yeah. know, he was like six foot two and, you know, I'm like five foot one. If I stretch, he just looked at mm -hmm. me and went, really? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so one time, but that wasn't even like harm OCD. That was Stacy like having zero you know, yeah. frustration tolerance left and doing something stupid. I think one of my favorite examples was one of my students was out doing live ERP from, this was back in the hospital days. And the, the person we were working with had this intrusive thought about getting into a car accident. So they were not driving and they were out driving and, and they ended up getting rear ended by someone who was texting and not paying attention. And yep. it turned out to be a wonderful experience. The, the, the person was like, wow, I handled that. Uh, I mean, I, I thought that would be the worst experience in the world. And it was like, uh, we exchanged info, the police came, we got the, in, you know, and, and I know what to do. I'll call my insurance company and then they'll take care of it. And, and they actually said to my student, can we continue to do the driving exposure? Cause they still had an hour left and they were like, yeah, let's go. Um, so it, it turned out to be an amazing experience for them to have experienced their worst fear in the world. Yeah, and uh, well, the, you know, as we're listing off Stacy issues, um, emetophobia is one of my things. And I remember one time I actually got a stomach bug. And uh -huh. when I was better, I called a friend of mine who, you know, knows this about me, knows all the OCD stuff. And I went, I made it through it. I did it. I did it. I got sick and it wasn't, you know, the world didn't end. And, you know, it's like, she's like, you know, most people aren't excited about this, Stacy. Yeah, right. <laughs> most of us don't call their friends and say, I threw up and survived. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but I literally did. Yeah. You know, um, because the fear is generally a hundred times worse than the actual event, even when the actual event sucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. TM says, can you share the book you spoke about last time on intrusive thoughts? We probably talked about the imp of the mind. Don't yes, you think that's what it was? Yeah. Yep. By Lee Bear. B, was it B-A-E-R? Is that how you spell Lee's last name? Or Oh, you're asking the blind person how to yeah, spell Yeah, that's true. That, that was a dumb, name. that was pretty dumb. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Lee Bear, the imp of the mind. That's what you want. <laughs> yes, but it is the imp of the mind. And it's a very good book. Um, I, I've had several people read it, friends, patients, family members. And it, a lot of them are like, other people think like this too, you know, hmm. because one thing about both OCD and SUD is they become very isolating disorders um, where you don't want to talk about what's, you know, going through your mind, what the thoughts that you're having, or the fact that you're struggling with substance use or you're relapsed on substances and your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller and they're very isolating. So even sometimes picking up a book and realizing you are not alone, that other people have had intrusive thoughts about harming others, about being a pedophile, um, about killing their husband or wife, the person they love the most in the world. Um, sometimes that can just be very beneficial and, and, and freeing. Um, I gave the book to a, a colleague of mine who I worked with and they disclosed that they were having OCD symptoms. They didn't know what to do. I said, first here, read this. Yeah. And they called me and they said, I never would have admitted to anyone in the world of having thoughts about killing my children until I read this book. Yeah. Right. You know, right. so know that you are not alone and there are other people out there. And if you get an opportunity to attend a conference or some organized activity. Orlando. That, yeah. Well, <laughs> whoop, whoop, mm -hmm. um, where you get to talk to other people with OCD. I mean, I think that is one of the most compelling things about the IOCDF conference yeah. is it's not just for professionals. I go to lots of conferences. I, you know, get something out of them. I get CEUs. I learn something. The IOCDF conference is my absolute favorite conference of all time. If I could only afford to go to one conference a year, that would be it. And it's because people who live with OCD attend, families attend, 
It's designed for those of us who are living with as well as those who are treating OCD. And it makes it a very unique experience. Um, so if you can attend one, I highly recommend it. And if you can't, because they are expensive travel and such, try to find something in closer to your local community that's just an OCD organization because people yeah. do different events, um, you know. And there's virtual conferences too, so. Yes, mm -hmm. and there, there are mm -hmm. virtual conferences. So, mm -hmm. but it's very much worth it just to get a sense of not being alone. Yeah. Uh, Crazy McD, this is a one for you, Stacy. Do quote unquote cured OCD people experience intrusive thoughts like everyone else? Yeah, every day. Every day. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and guess what? People even without OCD experience intrusive thoughts every day. Yep. So, every mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Just people who don't have OCD go, that was weird. Right. People with OCD go, uh, what does this mean? How do I stop it? Yes. Yeah. I could have the exact same thought as somebody with OCD and be like, eh. <laughs> yep. Whatever. Mm -hmm. So people sometimes want to go into the content or they'll say, what does it mean when I switch themes and why does it do that? Or, or what should I do when the theme switches? And then there's one very simple reply, uh, do ERP. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what it is, right? Yeah. It's like, all and right, the so. theme switches because OCD will attack whatever is important to you. Mm-hmm. Crazy McD says, so if I go OCD, was that was weird? Will uh, Or if I go, okay, that was weird, will it pass? Uh, it's a great start, right? That's mm -hmm. that's absolutely a great start. So, And, and in terms of... Sometimes it will pass and sometimes it will come back and you just keep going. That's weird, you know? Yeah. OCD, you know, sometimes I don't want to belittle the experience because I know how hard it is. But OCD is like a toddler. If you give in, you're doomed. You know, and if you fight back or set limits, you have opportunities to live the life you want to live. And not the life OCD wants you to live. Yes. And they are vastly different lives. Oh, totally. Totally, totally, yeah. totally lives. Yes. Totally, totally different. Mm -hmm. What's the best type of therapy for any type? Laura's asked about a specific type of OCD. Um, it, it would be for any type of OCD, it would be exposure and response prevention there, right? So, Yes. And I will say, you know, ACT is, a, is also helpful. Um, I think a combination of ACT and ERP is, you know, where I find my bread and butter as a professional <laughs> um, because ACT helps you identify why to do the work and what's important to you and can give you a little bit of motivation to do the ERP. So there are two options that people have used successfully exclusively, but when you combine them, I think you get a lot of bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. We got some deep questions tonight. These are fun. Um, love line. I'm going to get to yours in a minute, but Danny asks, how do you deal with harming deities? Well, when I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons with my friends, I try to harm all of the deities that I possibly can, because the amount of experience points I get for my characters to level up is incredible. <laughs> so boy, if you, if I can harm a deity and playing D and D that is awesome sauce. Let me just tell you <laughs> now, otherwise, I don't know about you, Stacy, but I'm I'm unsure if I've ever harmed a deity or not. So, well, I, I have no idea if I have, but you know, mm -hmm. I know just about enough about D and D to understand your reference, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would ask Danny, how would how would one know that one's harmed a deity? And the other thing that I think is amazing is that if you, as a mere mortal peasant human, can harm a deity, uh, that, that deity's not very strong. 
if, I mean, yeah. if that's the case, I mean, <laughs> if if we're these lowly creatures compared to a deity, uh, <laughs> how how did? I, well, they they must not be very strong if we can harm them in some way. So, <laughs> mm. but yeah. But OCD will always tell you, ah, but what if? What if you harmed a deity? Okay. Right? Yes. Yeah. I remember one time on this, uh, on the Wednesday webinar, someone said uh, they were afraid they might have sold their soul to the devil. And they mm -hmm. also said they don't know how to do it, but what if they did and they just didn't know it? So I invited all demons and devils and unearthly creatures to the end of the webinar for an auction of my soul. No one showed, proving your belief in me, I am the soulless bastard that you actually yes, think that, that I am. That I believe you to be. Because yes. nobody showed mm -hmm. up to the auction at all. Mm -hmm. nope. Yeah, There was nothing to buy. There was nothing to buy whatsoever. <laughs> yes. Uh, Love. This is an interesting one, and it's it's a little off OCD, but I think it's an interesting topic because of the the question of guilt and how much role of a guilt plays in OCD. Because for all of you, if you look at the DSM definition, we think it's crappy because it just talks about anxiety and distress, and it we believe disgust and guilt and shame and all these other unwanted emotions ought to also be a part of the definition as well, too. So. Love Lana says, what's the purpose of guilt when we lose someone we love very much? Do all humans go through that? Um, I I believe uh, probably everyone feels a myriad of emotions when someone we love dies. And one of them will be guilt because inevitably when someone we love dies, we're going to go back and think about, oh, geez, remember that one time that I did that? Why did I do? Oh, man. How how terrible! And maybe I never apologized for it, or or something like that. And um, yeah, so uh, you know, when when Susan died, when my wife died, I I had guilt feelings, right? Because as as hard as I tried for all of the years, and Stacy was with me through all of this, we were in a lot of contact through that. Um, when when there were times when maybe she dropped the fourth thing that day on the ground that I had to clean up uh, or or she you know would sit in a chair that she knew not to sit in because if she fell asleep she fell out of that chair very easily and and actually one time I I'll admit this to everybody one time I just took all those chairs and I brought them into the basement and and I did it because she couldn't get go down the stairs into the basement and and I I did it to keep her safe. And, oh, was she mad at me? I mean, I tell you, Stacey, she was oh, yeah. frustrated as hell uh, because she thought I was treating her like a child and I was trying to keep her alive, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had had several conversations about those chairs and yep. um, she would still sit in them, which I don't think she was doing purposely. I, she was on so many medications that her brain wasn't working well. And I think she just forgot that she shouldn't sit in those chairs anymore. Mm -hmm. But in the moment of it looked at me like I was such a jerk for doing that. But I did what I did because uh, I tried to do what I could to save her. And guess what? In the end, everybody dies, whether it's a goldfish, whether it's a human being, a dog, a cat, your frog, your snail, your whatever, whatever it is. Uh, there's a myriad of emotions that come along with loss and mm -hmm. guilt is just one of those that you will always wonder, could I have done something better than what I did? Yes. And it, it's, again, it's a human emotion. Like anxiety is a human emotion. There are times where you're going to have guilt. You know, you acknowledge it. The more you try to push it away, the stronger it rebounds on you. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, the acronym FEAR <laughs> stands for many things, you know. Forget everything and run, mm -hmm. which is where you, you know, do compulsions, use a substance, um, distract yourself with work or something else where you feel a higher level of competence and, you know, uh, 
somebody here mentioned not prioritizing treatment, but throwing themselves into work. Mm -hmm. All of that is under that, you know, forget everything and run. The other acronym for fear is false evidence appearing real, which, by the way, is pretty much everything OCD related. And the third one is face everything and recover. And that's really where exposure and therapy and treatment comes into play. You can do certain things to reduce the OCD symptoms in the short term, distract mm -hmm. with work, mm -hmm. dis you know, distract or we use compulsions, use substances. All might work in the short term. Yeah. But you're not looking for short term. Mm -hmm. looking for a longer term sustained recovery. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the reasons we do this webinar because we see a commonality between substance use and OCD, which is how can I get the fix right now? And how can I avoid pain and suffering and anything that's uncomfortable? Right. Yeah. So and say, how can, I can, how can I deal with uncertainty? You know, mm -hmm. how can I face the next moment, the next hour, the next day without yeah. knowing what will happen? Yeah. So say the three fear things again, because I think a few people just ran to get a pen and paper so that they could write those down because uh, I'm getting some question on them. So okay. fear. So the first one is forget everything and run. And I'm going to forget assume everything and run. Forget okay. everything and run. Yep. And we're all grown ups here. So you can replace that F word with whatever one fits best. <laughs> <laughs> um, get everything and run, keeping it family friendly. Yes, there you go. And then the second one is false evidence appearing real. Love that one. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, all of OCD. And face everything and recover. Yep. Or I came up with another one just in my head. Oh, good. Go ahead. Face exposures and recover. Nice. Now I've got four. There you go. Yep. Some people have asked us to discuss some real event OCD things. Was that ever a area for you there, uh, Miss Stacy? No, actually, not so much. Okay. You know, something really happened in my life. You know, that was a different, you know, venue for me. Mm hmm. You know, um, well, actually, I say that and I don't know if that's exactly true because I have a GI disorder and I have OCD around food contamination. Mm, so boy, those, that does that's not a good combo right there. No, it's really not. <laughs> no, mm -mm. not at all. Yeah. And so I say no I'm, to the real life, but in real life, I have a GI disorder and I have OCD that tells me my food, it wasn't cooked right. It's going to make me sick. And you know what? Sometimes it's not the food. It's the GI disorder. The food didn't do it. The GI disorder did. But you know, when you start not feeling well, your OCD goes, see, I told you, you didn't cook it right. And, oh God, I can go off on a tangent. And that's one area I probably still struggle with the most because there's some reality in my life, but I've learned to separate the two. The OCD is not real. The GI disorder is. So I've learned what foods are triggering to the GI disorder and I don't eat them. Mm -hmm. And then I can tell the little dude in my head, shut up. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so yes. And I've also worked with therapists who say, so how do you do exposures for somebody who fears that they're going to die of a peanut allergy who actually has a peanut allergy? Well, we don't go give them peanuts, first of all. Yes. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you don't go giving someone alcohol to expose them if they have an SUD problem. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. 
you know. So real event would be you have a doubt about a memory. You may remember doing something, but now wonder, do I remember it correctly? What if I did something, but I forgot about it? Uh, I'll give you examples. I heard there was a hit and run yesterday. And I know when I was driving yesterday, I was a little tired. What if I might have fallen asleep, swerved, caused an, another car to then hit someone and and then they drove off, you know, just all these things where how am I responsible for something that could have happened or did happen in the past? And how did I forget the fact that I played a role in it whatsoever? Yeah. I see this a lot in people who have both OCD and SUD. They're mm -hmm. like, did I drink last night? Yeah. You know, um, or if they have a compulsion about using, do I really want to be in recovery? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so when you have both of these, th this comes up a lot. Um, and then there's usually a great deal of research that gets done. That can be online research. I've seen people drive back to spots on highways looking to see if there's car parts somewhere or mm. anything like that to, as proof that maybe this happened or looking up to see if there's people who are in hospitals now. Uh, maybe somehow I played a role in them being in the hospital in some way. Um, it, it could be even, I, I know... I know I was had a few drinks the other night and I had a conversation with you, but I don't remember if I might have said anything inappropriate. So now, while I'm sober, I'm going to hound you to ask you if I might have said anything inappropriate. And of course, then what happens, and I've seen this happen, is the people you're asking are like, I, you need to not talk to me anymore and stay away from me because uh, you're really kind of freaking me out. And so then... Of course, the person with OCD believes, oh, maybe I'm freaking them out because I said some bad things to them. And maybe, mm -hmm. you know, and it just on and on and on and on. So it feeds on itself. It's this constant need to be reassured that the memory I have is the true memory and there's no clouds in the memory or anything like that whatsoever. Is distraction a compulsion? Well, distraction is a safety behavior. There's five safety behaviors, uh, avoidance, reassurance, distraction, substance use, and compulsions. All of them are done to feel good in the moment, right? So in OCD, distraction could become a compulsion for some people if it's used to somehow try to neutralize a, an intrusive thought or image or urge. And I have to do this thing. And if I don't, something bad will happen or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, there's a lot of use of safety behaviors in anxiety and OCD. Yeah. And, and as you said, safety behaviors can become compulsions, including using of substances, because you get to a point where you get very compulsive about the substance. And part of the diagnosis for SUD is constantly seeking a substance, how you're going to use it, when you're going to use it, getting money to use it. Um, so it's actually in the diagnostic criteria that you're constantly engaging in behavior around the substance use, even when you're not actually using the substance. Mm -hmm. Another one on real event. How about a doctor who mentally reviews cases over and over and over to reassure themselves they didn't miss anything important? Um, potentially, right? And, and I would, so we would have an obsession of what if I miss something and that will then cause this person to have harm. I'm just picking some random things here mm -hmm. and then they'll die and then it'll be discovered that I missed something and then the family will sue me and then I'll lose my license and I'll be the pariah of my family for having lost my license. And then there'll be a summary judgment against me and I'll probably go to jail and I'll be in the newspaper and then my family will divorce me and leave me because who would want to be married to anybody who has killed someone out of negligence? And then I'll die in prison, lonely and destitute. 
Hey, who gave you permission to be in my head? (laughs) (laughs) You know, the best compliment I have ever received is, it's hard to believe you don't have OCD because you sure think like you do. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so that might be one way, HG. So then what do you do? You might say to the member, the patient, "Hey, come back tomorrow. I just want to go over some things one more time. I want I want to run a few more tests, and then when those come back negative, well, maybe just a few more tests. And maybe you're doing all of these things to try to assure yourself that you're safe, that you're okay. But it can definitely be at the expense of everybody else in the situation, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, We're getting some questions around distinguishing between exposure and response prevention in management of OCD. So it's two parts, right? Exposure is what is the obsession? What is the intrusive thought or image or urge? And allowing that to be there. Letting it be there without doing anything to neutralize it. And that's response prevention. So you could very easily think of it like this. What is response prevention? the elimination of compulsion, right? The opposite of doing the compulsion is doing response prevention. So if you think of compulsion as the typical response that you have to an obsession, right? That thing that you do to neutralize that thought or image or urge, response prevention is not doing that thing and allowing for that thing just to be there. So Stacy. There's a chance between now and when this webinar ends, I will grab a bottle of alcohol that I have in my house and stuff a rag in it, lighting it on fire, throwing it at my neighbor's house and making it into a Molotov cocktail. And then going into the middle of the street, pooping into a bag, lighting it on fire, putting in front of another neighbor's house, ringing the doorbell. They'll come out and see a flaming bag, stomp on it, get flaming poop on their shoe. I will laugh at them. And then shoot three geese that are flying over my house because I got a ton of them because there's a lake behind my house. And then... I will come back and continue the webinar. And guess what? I will do no compulsion to stop that whatsoever. No. So now there's my intrusive thoughts about throwing flaming bottles of alcohol at people's homes and pooping in a bag and lighting it on fire and putting in front of another person's home and then shooting some geese and then coming back. And I will do absolutely no compulsion whatsoever to try to prevent that from happening. And let's just see if it does. And that's exposure and response prevention. There we go. Right. It's also Otherwise, really good that you and I don't live in the same state. Because I would definitely put a flaming bag of poop in front of your house. Just oh, so I would know. totally. Just because of how many times you use that as an example. <laughs> <laughs> I would do it just once. Just yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put one in front of your hotel room at the conference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really funny. Uh, Saturn says, just watching this is an exposure for me and I'm crying right now, but that tells me I really needed this. So thank you for doing this. Well, that's awesome. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, and that's what I think is fun doing this with you, Stacey, is because, you know, people could listen to me talk all the time, but I I don't have OCD, right? I I treat it. But for people to see you who deals with albinism, legally blind, and OCD, and substance use, and very successful in your career, traveling the world, visiting friends, doing all these things now that I know for decades of your life, you figured there was no freaking way you were ever going to do. And you are the example of what it's like to come out on the other side, right? Yeah. I I am famous for saying that if in, when I was engaged in treatment and somebody said, what do you want out of life? I would have sold myself so short. Mm-hmm. Then and you are short, so short. there's that yeah. too. Yeah, but, there is that. You know, I'm five yeah. foot one if I stretch on a good day, <laughs> and, and as as a female, I'll probably get closer to five feet. <laughs> <as we> go. <laughs> yeah. You know, mm-hmm. but yeah, 
No. Uh, recovery is amazing, but it, it, it takes time, energy, and effort. But myself and other people who advocate and who share their experience, um, you know, I, lo I love Ethan Smith, and he says, you know, his mess became his message. Mm -hmm. um, everybody in the advocacy realm will tell you that recovery is completely worth all of the time, energy, and effort, you know, and I threw things at my therapist. I mean, I, not hard things, but I did throw things at my therapist mm -hmm. um, because for them, ERP was, you know, just a thing. I remember doing a really hard exposure during therapy. And at the end of it, my therapist was like, oh, the seam in my pants came out. And I did. I threw my jacket at them. I'm like, I'm doing the hardest work of my life, and you're concerned about the seam in your pants? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, I probably uh, used uh, some of those other F words as well because I didn't have the best filter at that point in my life either. <laughs> yeah. But recovery is is more than you could hope for, but it does take a lot of work. I mean, you guys are seeing the finished product when I talk about this, but I didn't work for two years. I mean, I was unemployable for two years. And that's the level where things took me. I got into recovery from SUD first and white knuckled my way to four and a half years of recovery. And then the rug got pulled out from underneath me in terms of other mental health and anxiety disorders that I had to address. And I didn't hold a job for two years while I focused on treatment. And so there were a lot of things for me to do. I, you know, had some really stressful, rough times in my recovery process. So it's not simple. And I, I, I want to say that because when you see the finished product, like you said, you've known me post-treatment. So the fact yeah. that I would worry about inviting you anywhere just is not the person you met. Um, right. But <clears throat> the hours I spent just stressing over these things, I mean, I would get two hours of sleep per night, you know, for, for multiple reasons, because the one that you forgot is I also have a diagnosis of PTSD. Um, so mm -hmm. I was having lots of fun with anxiety and substances and all of this. Um, uh, my late teens and early 20s, let's face it, were a train wreck mm -hmm. and a life that nobody would want. I mean, I was the person who was not invited to family get togethers because nobody wanted to deal with me. Even my sponsor, because I did do a 12 step program, told people when I got my you know third year medallion for the first two years of my sobriety, she wouldn't tell me where she lived because she wasn't sure how this was going to turn out. <laughs> She would meet me places. Like yeah. We'd go for coffee. We'd go for mm -hmm. pizza. But I wasn't allowed to know where she lived. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that level of dysfunction and disorder that came into my life. And as I got into recovery and got some of the gifts that recovery brings with it, both from substance use and from anxiety disorders, I then started on a path to become a therapist because one of my goals was to have more effective treatment because the relapse rate for SUD and OCD and the treatment that was available at that time. Back then, um, Michael Jenicki put out an article that said it took 17 years for somebody to get an accurate diagnosis and good treatment for OCD. So a lot of this you know, was, went round and round and round until I found somebody who actually, you know, put their finger on it and got me over that last little bit. Like I did CBT for, you know, substance use disorder. I did a little DBT in there and that got me better. 
But when we started to address the OCD and used ERP, I got well. Mm -hmm. That's when the insides and the outsides started to match. And that was a huge transition because I could look functional. You know, I had, I'd been in sobriety. I had some treatment. I had some skill sets to push back against the anxiety, but I hadn't done ERP yet. So I was working um, and holding down a job and holding down my own apartment and, you know, learning to socialize and be a young adult. But inside, I constantly struggled because the OCD was not treated. It's like SUD, the PTSD got me here. The OCD was the last part. And when I got introduced to ERP, something clicked. And like I said, I threw things at my therapist. It was some of the hardest work I ever did. I had anxiety about going to therapy, but I went because I was absolutely convinced that there had to be something better than what I had. And then I started meeting people who were better. And then I, was, then I started chasing it. Like I started creating my own ERP. I'm like, my, I don't need my therapist to figure this out. This is the problem. This is the, the ERP and this is what I'm gonna do. And then ERP became part of my life. It wasn't even a case of, doing a hierarchy. It was, you know, no, these are situations that I'm going to engage in and I'm not going to do any response prevention, you know, counterbalance, touch things, enter and exit the same door, all, all, all these things that, you know, if you do it this way, it will be, all be okay. Um, I just started living the life that I wanted to live, doing the things I wanted to do. And when it came up, I pushed back and I said, no, I'm a little dude in my head, shut up. And if I thought, well, I have to do, I started to say, no, I don't have to do. Let me do something different. Let me, you know, use another door. Let me not touch something. Let me touch something. You know, I actually would bump into people on the bus, you know, just a little nudge, like we are going down to sit and you just push mm -hmm. a little too far over and I'd be, oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. You know, and then not do anything with my hands or get off the bus or anything that, you know, so you start doing things like that because you start to see that it's this much better and then it's this much better and then it's this much better. And then something stressful comes up and it might come back where you're struggling again but you know what you can do this time and it gets back to this much better. And I've never met anybody in a recovery process that says, oh no, this isn't worth it, this sucks. You know, no, it's kind of like retirement. I've never really met anybody who said, oh, I, I, I hate retirement. I wish I'd go back to my, you know, 40 hour a week stressful job, you know? Mm -hmm. Recovery is the same way, but it does take a great deal of work. And for people who are seeing me on these webinars who are introduced to the recovered person, it looks very different than the person who is sleeping two hours a night, checking things in my apartment in a certain pattern for two hours and going out and getting off the bus and being late for work and, um, you know, throwing out food that I couldn't afford to throw out because it was, you know, not cooked right and, you know, poisonous. And um, I cost myself a lot of money and a lot of sleep and a lot of distress, but I knew there was something better. And I think part of that was started in AA um, and then carried over to when I went to therapy but it took a while to kind of unravel the knot that was all of the co-occurring for me, but I wouldn't trade it now for anything in the world. And as I said, sometimes things come up and I re-engage in exposure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do some goofy things still. 
I was at a conference. I ordered food. The steak didn't look like it was cooked right. I went through this whole scenario in my head. I took pictures of the steak in case, you know, I did die from it. People would have proof of what killed me. This doesn't make any sense. You know what? I ate the steak because that was the response prevention for me. You're going to eat this. Um, And guess what? I didn't die. Obviously, because you're here. So, yeah, it's amazing. Uh Yeah. Yeah. But I think I wanted to just take some time to acknowledge that this road was not, you know, this linear, oh, life is grand. No, it was a lot of time, energy, and effort. And dedication to treatment. I think one of the things that has amazed me as as a professional in mental health is if somebody tells you you have a medical problem, people are more likely to engage in treatment for that. Not that people don't have denial and all of that in medical areas, but generally if somebody says you have cancer or, you know, you have this hernia, they're like, okay, what do we got to do? And people engage in it, even when the treatment is horrible, um, which you lived with your wife, it, mm-hmm. there's nothing pleasant about trying to treat cancer. No, it really sucked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really does suck. Um, mm-hmm. But people will do it in mental health. We kind of say, well, I don't really have the time. I don't really, you know, want to do that. I need to focus on other things. I mean, I've literally worked with people who I say, I say you need to fill out FMLA paperwork and go do a day treatment program yeah. for a couple of weeks to jumpstart your OCD recovery. And you can either do it now or you can do it later. But um, that level is needed for some people and you're going to have to dedicate some time to the recovery process or you're not going to get there. This is a disabling disordered, you know, that's why it's called OCD or SUD. That last part is disorder. It's disrupting your life. You're going to have to pay attention and dedicate some time to treatment. And depending how severe your OCD is, just like any other illness, that will mean whether you can do outpatient IOP or you need residential level of care. But it won't get better without dedicating some time, energy, and effort to the process. That was like a master class right there. So thank you for that. (laughs) Yeah, well, I don't want people to think this happened overnight. This took a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and it still takes work. Yes. Yeah. It's it's not like you don't ever have intrusive thoughts or urges or cravings or anything anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Uh no. No. Mm-hmm. I mean, I honestly, I've been in recovery from SUD now for 30 years. It was 30 years on February 20th. So, it's been a hot minute. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then I will go to like the reception at the IOCD conference and I yeah. can tell what everybody's drinking. I'm like, Oh, that's gin. That's yeah. rum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like mm-hmm. my brain has not forgotten. No. Um, you know, but I, I just don't have, you know, for me now it's more of a game like, Oh, that's gin. That's rum. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, but the desire or the compulsion isn't there anymore. And that that is a is a freedom that came over time. Um, you can still have, like I said, I took pictures of my steak. You know, we're not talking about 2002. We're probably talking more like 2014, 2015. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, so it does pop up from time to time in in, in different ways, even when you're in recovery. And you just, once you figure out what it is, you're like, oh, crap. (laughs) Yeah, okay, I know what this is. Then you can shift directions because you have enough tools in your toolbox to do that. So it's not that I don't ever struggle. It's that now I can quickly identify and use whatever tool I need to get back to what I was doing, to what's important, to the things I want to do. I go to theme parks all the time. Do you know how disgustingly 
dirty those things are. Like I watch the kids in the line with me lick the railing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm like, eh. but I go because I love rides. I love roller coasters. I love all things theme park. I love to people watch, which is ironic since I'm legally blind, but um, you know, that's a valued activity for me. So I watch kids lick railings and I go on rides. And you know what? I do good hand hygiene, but I don't go overboard. You know. Life can hand us a lot of, uh, or a lot of roadblocks. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to bet you might have, Stacy. don't let me put words in your mouth, but I'm going to bet you gave a few excuses at some point in your life about why not to change. Who, me? <laughs> Could have written a book on it. <laughs> 101 reasons why my therapist yeah. is full of doo-doo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes people will say things like, well, it's not a good time to do blank. Uh, I don't know when there will be a good time. I don't know that there is a good time. So I think you have to pick a time. Right. Yeah. I mean, no one's ever said, you know, I went out this morning on a flat tire, but it was actually a good time to have a flat tire. You know, I, I haven't yeah. really heard that. Uh, you know, just, um, so if you're, if you're waiting for the sign, the right time, maybe this webinar is the sign or the, of the right time to go to. All right, Stacy, take us out. Tell us a little bit about you and the SUD, OCD, SIG, and everything. Again, uh, Dr. McGrath and I run the OCD, SUD special interest group. We have a website, ocdsud.com, or you can find us um, on the IOCDF website under the special interest groups. And there's a link there that puts in a response um, that gets you added to an email list. Um, and when we update the website or are sharing information about a conference or an event where OCD SUD information will be shared, we send out um, an email. Um, it, it's hit or miss, I'm not going to lie, but you know, it's good to go to the website, check some things out. And again, when we do know something, an event, a talk, something's coming up or we update something on the website, we will send out information. So if that's of interest to you, go check out the website, put in a response, send an email, and we'll add you to the email group. Um, we're always looking for resources. So if you're someone who knows of a resource for specifically OCD and SUD, because we do try to focus on that for this particular website, feel free to share it. The more we get knowledge about this and the more the community comes together, the less, less isolating it will feel. And I will be at the Orlando conference unless, you know, Patrick takes me out. I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and be happy to, you know, talk to people introduce yourself. Now remember, I'm legally blind. So if you're waving at me as a means to get my attention, I'm not ignoring you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You actually have to come say hi. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you're going to feel like, well, Stacy ignored me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nope. So, but and there's lots of information out there. So go check it out. And on our end, thanks to our host tonight, NoCD. NoCD, a online platform for the treatment of OCD and related conditions. Check them out at nocd.com or treatmyocd.com. Lots of great content on there, uh, articles about all sorts of various subtypes of OCD and the way that OCD can come about and what you can do for treatment. And NoCD has therapy available in all 50 states, as well as Canada, the UK, and Australia and takes a lot of insurance also in the U.S. as well, too. So check us out again at nocd.com. Uh, one other thing that we do in addition to ERP for OCD, but we also do habit reversal work for 
uh, the FRB ticks and we treat hoarding. And we also have what we call our NoCD 411 session. So if you have a family member or friend who has OCD, but they're just not quite ready for prime time treatment and you want some info about that, reach out to us at nocd.com for a NoCD 411 session. Stacy, we'll see you back here in a month. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Bye, everybody.